trying to analyze Dune for a couple of months now, but I always had something else going on. The hype train for the new movie adaptation is largely gone now, so maybe it's a good moment to take a step back and see what is going on here on the symbolic plane. I have to admit that, as a dedicated fan since a dollar sense, I was very satisfied with what Villeneuve did with the material. For a starter, I'd recommend Empire of the Mind's review. He did some fantastic work and I hold a very similar view to his. This video is not going to be a review, so I assume you've at least seen the movie, and I'm not going to pay much attention if I'm spoiling anything. Moreover, some of the spoilers will go well beyond the first volume of the book series. Luckily, much like some of the works of Dostoevsky, Dune belongs to the set of great novels that spoil the ending right at the beginning, so that you can enjoy the journey there in peace, without the restlessness of a whodunit. I will take a symbol-by-symbol symbol approach, ranging from the overarching themes of the story to visual details of the movie. We'll see if I can fit everything in a single video. I hope you enjoy the show, and if you do, please remember to share it with your friends and foes. The main conflict. It is not easy to pinpoint the ultimate theme of Dune. Its story unfolds over six volumes and never actually reaches its final resolution, as Frank Herbert died before he managed to write the seventh and last book. The timeline spans over millennia, and also it's up to you if you consider Brian Herbert and Kevin Anderson's multiple prequels and sequels canon. What was a toppling of an old hierarchy in one volume quickly becomes a decaying organization itself in the next. It brings back to mind the famous quote from Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, that you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. It resembles the events of the Old Testament, where David is the long-awaited righteous king, but later succumbs to sin. His wise son Solomon built the temple for God yet became idolatrous later in his life. While the Bible has its New Testament, where everything is fulfilled in Christ, one cannot establish an anchor like that for Dune. Thus, when Paul Atreides reconquers Dune from the Harkonnen, we can look at it both as the return of the king to eradicate corruption, and as barbarians bringing chaos and destruction to a working hierarchy. The aspects of the first interpretation include the fact that the Atreides were given authority over Dune by the Emperor, so Paul took over what was rightfully his, while the previously persecuted Fremen could now establish the proper order across the whole galaxy. The other side of the coin reveals to us that the Atreides had been gaining power among the noble houses and started posing a threat to the Emperor even before the events in the book, and we do not know if the galaxy under the leadership of House Corino was a corrupt tyranny or a properly functioning hierarchy. We could see the whole story as a vile plot by Leto Atreides to barbarously take over the, the galaxy using the potential of the Fremen warriors. The ferocious jihad that follows the events on Arrakis, taking billions of lives with it, makes it easier to view the story from this angle. The planet. Even though Arrakis at least on the surface, is devoid of any water. It's best to see it as an ocean, that is, absolute chaos. It is a place of death, but also life. A place of immense danger, but also of immeasurable potential. The scene of Atreides arriving on the orbit could very well serve as a visualization for conception or fertilization in biology textbooks. They have the ability to harness that potential, to structure and direct it, to give it meaning and purpose. Please forgive me if you're grossed by all these Freudian comparisons, but symbols work on many levels of reality at the same time, and this particular one seems easy to grasp, as it's quite immediate to us. That is also why the Freudian stuff caught on so easily, I think. So phallic manifestations of oppressive patriarchy are such a prevalent topic in feminist publications. Coming back down to Arrakis, the lens that focuses everything about the planet is the worm. It is best to understand it not as a pillar, but as a void, a hole. Oh, sorry, that's from another movie. The worm is the guardian of chaos. A bit like entropy, 
it reduces everything to sand. In fact, it is the very reason why Dune is a desert, as the worm's larva stage, the sand trout, has the ability to drain large amounts of water. It is called the Maker, but also Shaitan. It doesn't tolerate any odor. It is infuriated by the regular thumps of a walking person or a thumper. The arrival of the sandworm is marked by an effect that could be called the liquefying of sand, as the ground becomes unstable and things start to sink in it, not unlike in quicksand. It makes it easier to see Arrakis as a giant ocean full of monsters and treasures. It is a bit of a flip of the imagery we are used to, as in the later volumes when water and greenery are reintroduced to the surface of Dune, it is more telling to not see it as the nature taking over, but rather new order being established by the humans, making the planet more habitable but less fertile at the same time. The feminine and the masculine. At first, it must be noticed how the new Dune movie stays faithful to the source material in terms of its presentation of male and female characters. Thanks to that, the men are actually men, in fact quite capable most of the time, while the characters played by women are indeed feminine, with the exception of Liette, whose character, after gender swapping, was not rewritten into something more feminine. Other than that, we have hierarchy-oriented or men who know their place on the ladder, and are ready to sacrifice for what is above, and powerful and protective women that value life higher than order. Duke Leto's off-screen vice might have been a too high hunger for power and control for taking over the Emperor's throne, so he went for the high-risk, high-yield game of diving in chaos with the hope of finding the hidden peril, the desert power. To give a more general comment about the masculine and the feminine, they are normally attracted to each other, the masculine is drawn by the chaos, where it finds the treasure or death, while the feminine looks for security and stability of the dry land. Think of it next time you see the earning statistics for men versus women, or some phenomena on the matrimonial market. Duke Leto took the riskiest bet and lost. We don't know if he could take a safer path or not. Other than that, he's a loving partner and father that's not caricaturally oppressive towards his son or a complete loser. That's really rare in Hollywood, so I wanted to dwell on that for a bit. As for Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, he obviously wasn't a very diligent student of symbolic thinking. He had been advised to, after taking his victory against House Atreides, spare the rest of it, Jessica and Paul. Maybe if he took them hostage, let live and send back to Caladan, they wouldn't even pose a threat to him. However, he went for what always tempts a hierarchy, the totality of rule, getting rid of the margins. It had to blow in his face, and it will in the next installment of the movie, in the form of a character that's, well, femininity incarnate. Yes, if anyone's looking for what a strong feminine character should look like, Dune is the way to go. The feminine is the judge, as Jordan Peterson tends to say, if the masculine is good enough, we have it beautifully illustrated in the famous pain box scene. In some sense, this is what every woman does to every man, or what the underworld does to a hero. It poses a question, are you worthy? If you are, you will find the pearl. If you're not, you'll meet your death. In the very same scene, we can see a great model for motherhood in Lady Jessica. She loved her partner and put that love ahead of the hierarchical order by giving him a son and disobeying her superiors. We see later in the movie that she also loves her son and is ready to not only disobey any order, but also turn quite vicious to protect him. That's what femininity is generally about. But she is not the devouring mother that would not let her child face the void and ever grow up. No, she lets him be taken away to the test while she herself is standing outside having her heart pierced by the sword, if you want to trace this trope back to the Bible. The Bene Gesserit are a force in the Empire that everyone, even the Emperor himself, has to reckon with. But they fall for a similar temptation as Baron Harkonnen. They think that they will always have the ability to decide who is going to find life and who is going to find death, who will live and who will die. Which is quite nicely symbolized by their breeding program, that they will always be able to execute their judgment, be the neck of the body directing the head 
where they want, like a puppet. A puppet they wanted their Quisets Haderach to be for them. But order can at times tame chaos quite painfully, and even the mighty female convent will have to bend the knee before what they produced. Religion. Jonathan Pajot says that if your father was an alcoholic, you take part in the pattern whether you drink yourself or not, either by following a model or opposing it. This is more or less Dune's relationship with religion. There's a number of sci-fi works that don't deal with God, faith and religion at all, but Dune is generally considered to be a warning against following charismatic and powerful, godlike individuals. It tends to be not only misguided, as hierarchy is inevitable, but also quite ironic at times, as everything that happens across the series of books, either good or bad, is committed by charismatic, focused and determined individuals. I don't recall an alternative of a collective effort directed equally by everyone to be in operation at any time, not to mention showing it as a viable road to take. While Frank Herbert seems to be proposing a world without a sense of an actual divine, we must understand that it was the 60s and the philosophical removal of the highest good had not reached its logical conclusion in nihilism of today yet. Humans are not yet a cancer to be cut out from the universe. Quite the contrary, there is a spark of divinity in the human being that leads to probably my favorite part of Dune's world building, the great crusade against thinking machines, also known as the Butlerian Jihad. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind, says the commandment. Why wouldn't you? Was living with AI unbearable to humans? So what? Should it not have just taken over? No, there is something sacred about human beings. The book won't admit it, but it cannot escape that pattern. We do have a soul. In a similar way, we are presented with Bene Gesserit's Missionaria Protectiva, a Machiavellian construct to spread superstitions among primitive people in order to manipulate and use them for their own purposes when time comes. Bene Gesserit missionaries did that among the Fremen on Arrakis, sure, but was Paul really just a false prophet playing the Fremen into fulfilling Bene Gesserit's goals? Do gurus of some strange sects, however charismatic they would be, really see the future? Are the mantat level computational capabilities of his brain enough for Paul Muad'Dib to be able to see, even with his eyes burned off? Did Herbert really want to create a godless universe where religion is merely opium for the masses? Did he succeed? Thank you for watching this episode. I think there's more to dig up here, so one day there will come another video dedicated to the magnificent work of art that is Dune. I hope you're already subscribed to the channel and that you will leave a comment below. I would be especially grateful if you let me know if I misconstrued anything about Dune's lore. It's been a good two decades since I read it and I actually never read a book more than once. Have a blessed day.